sometimes it feels like we're bitchy if we have these boundaries but the way that you just spoke them they sound so doable and so you're talking about being a woman of worth and value and it's not about this you know being aggressive but just about uh no i i that really won't work for me but can i can i get back to you in 24 hours it's like yeah, that's it. Why can't I do that? I'm really excited to introduce my next guest expert, Sandy Weiner, who will be talking today on the topic, boundaries aren't bitchy. And I'm really looking forward to this because I think that what she's going to be sharing today is so key and so foundational when it comes to dating. So I'm super excited about her talk. But first, I want to tell you a little bit more about Sandy. So Sandy Weiner, founder of Last First Date, is devoted to helping women over 40 achieve healthy toe-curling love. She's an internationally known TEDx speaker, a dating coach, author, and a podcast host. Sandy specializes in helping women communicate effectively, set clear boundaries in relationships, and know their true worth. She believes a woman of value attracts her best partner. Sandy's work has been featured in Mind Body Green, in the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, and The Good Men Project. She's also the host of Last First Date Radio, an acclaimed show about attracting and sustaining healthy relationships in midlife. Sandy wants you to go on your last first date, and we do too, so I'm so excited to bring on Sandy. Hi, Sandy. Welcome. Hi, Cammie. Thank you for that lovely intro. Thank you so much for being here today. And I thought we could start out by you just sharing a little bit about your background and how is it that you came to be a love coach and found your company? Well, I grew up in a home that was fairly dysfunctional, as most of us do. And um, I would say it was a high um, conflict home. There was a lot of yelling. Um, and and I didn't witness a lot of love. And so I didn't have that roadmap that I was looking for. So I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I chose a husband in my late 20s who I thought was going to be safe for me. He had some of the values that I was looking for. He seemed really stable. And most importantly, he really wanted to get married. And most men my age did not. And I thought he would keep me safe. Um, and... It did not turn out that way. Um, we had some big challenges in our marriage that most marriage was, marriages probably would not survive. And the big one was we had a, our firstborn child was born with a genetic disease and he passed away when he was five of a brain tumor. So mm -hmm. that was uh, really devastating. But one of the most important lessons that I took away from that whole experience was the importance of how we deal with crisis. Oh. And I really, now when I'm dating post-divorce, I look for men who have weathered crisis well, who have learned from the hard stuff, um, as I have. And so finally, I had the courage to leave after 23 years, and I began my life again and woke up to the possibilities of what I had been suppressing um, because of my people-pleasing tendencies. And, um, and I was reclaiming all those parts that I lost to try to keep the peace in the home. Mm. And one of those parts was the ability to help people. Uh, I was an artist. Uh, if you could see behind me all this stuff back there is stuff that I've oh, painted. Wow. Um, so that's what I did for most of my life. And but there was this other part that wasn't met. And that was the part that really got people. And if, if you looked at my eighth grade yearbook, or my, actually my senior yearbook in 12th grade, it was like, Sandy's the go-to person when you have troubles and she's got you know, problem solving skills and all that stuff. So I wanted to go back and get some kind of certification in that. So I became a life coach. And one of the biggest transformations for me in life coaching was you know, I thought I had all these skills, but I realized how much I didn't know. Um, sort of that beginner's mind, which I think is so important in all of this, and people who are here in the summit, it's, it's so important to come and be open to learning and growing because 
you know, if we're not learning, you know, we might as well be dead, <laughs> in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other part was, I realized how much judgment I had, and how important curiosity is. And that really is something that colors my coaching, um, is to help people get out of assumption and into, um, into questions. Um, so a couple of years after I coached, um, I was helping my friends with their dating and helping them write profiles. And I would go for walks with this one woman every day. And she was such a freaking mess. I mean, she was <laughs> attracting every narcissist and you know, <laughs> misinterpreting every guy's words. Like he would say something so blatantly truthful and upfront about how unavailable he was. And she'd say, what do you think that means? <laughs> and I'd say, it means exactly what he said. Yes. Face, let's take it at face. <laughs> Face value. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah. <laughs> and she then, you know, one day she called me the man whisperer, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and so I uh, pursued this career, and I have loved every minute. I mean, I think when you're working in a field, when you help people um, improve their lives, there is nothing, nothing better than that. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all about your background. Mm -hmm. um, you said something that I thought was really interesting, which was about challenge. And I think that uh, that just made me think about, you know, really getting to know someone and how it is that they can navigate different aspects of their life or the different facets of who they are in different situations, because we can all come and we get cleaned up and show up and put up our best foot forward on dates and, but really getting to know someone and how they are in different aspects of their life with different people in different situations. And I've heard stories, you know, from women who've been dating and they start to go through real challenges in their lives that were unexpected. And that's when they decided that a particular person that they were seeing, like, wow, if he can weather this storm with me, then he is the one. And conversely, other stories where the guy just kind of couldn't really show up in that mm -hmm. situation. So I, I really appreciate that you mentioned that. I think that's mm. important. It's so important. It's one of the most critical pieces, I think, and which is why you really need to get to know somebody over time and over stressful moments. And it can even be driving in traffic. You know, do they have road rage? Um, mm. There are so many ways you can see this. I, I have a friend who just remarried, and he, it went really, really fast, this relationship. And I said, well, do you know, what is she like in a crisis? <laughs> I kept saying wow. to him. And I said, what's she like in traffic? What's she like? And he said, she's, she's weathered every storm well. Like she, both of them had done so much work on themselves. And that's, that's really one of the most beautiful parts of dating at this age is that if you have done the work, then you're your more refined version of you. And you're really able to connect on such a deep, authentic level. Mm. And I know that that is something that uh, many of the women who are with us in the summit are wanting is that deeper connection with someone. So thank you for that. Mm. So I know you have some wonderful things to share with us. And starting with, I wanted to ask you about what it is that you think is the number one mistake that single women make when they're dating. Well, I think they make a mistake at the beginning of dating. Like, this is something that they should do throughout dating, but even from the very start, um, to really speak up and speak your standards, um, tell a man what you like, what you don't like, um, and what, what's important to you. So you're, you're setting boundaries and setting your standards. So obviously you have to do the work to know your standards first, but to say that doesn't work for me. Um, so I, I'll give you an example. Once I had a guy who sent me a first email online and it was like, you are the most amazing woman. I mean, this, we hadn't <laughs> talked to you, you are so amazing. I think you're like the perfect woman for me. And I have opera seats, box, box seats for the opera for this Friday. Do you want to go with me? <laughs> it was just like, wow, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> So I, I reined it in, you know, thank you. It's very flattering, but I'd like to talk to you first because that's a standard of mine is, you know, I like to get on the phone before I meet because I don't know if we'll have any connection at all. And let's, I like to meet for coffee. And if we have a connection, then opera might be a great thing farther down the road. 
Um, and it, it, you know, and that date was just so awful <laughs> in every Oh respect. my goodness. Well, it's a good thing you didn't go to the opera. Was, oh my God. I don't even like opera. But <laughs> <that's> <laughs> well, they're story. usually four hours long. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, it would have been an hour trip into Manhattan and then sitting at the Metropolitan Opera in box seats with somebody I don't even like. I mean, and, and the other thing is like, if it's a safety thing, like some people will ask you out to go on a hike on a first date and you don't know them. So yeah. know, know what you need, know what you want, um, you know, and I, I believe it's never too early to speak up. You're making me think of something about the online dating. And sometimes people will get into um, a communication where they're emailing or sending the messages back and forth. And what do you tell women about when is it to... You know, sometimes I think that can go on for too long and it kind of turns into this virtual kind of relationship. What do you advise about that? When's the right time to meet someone? Well, I think after a few messages, you, you're getting on the phone or you're, or you're cutting your losses. You know, it's, it's I, I advise women to just say, you know, it's been fun connecting with you. Um, but, you know, the way I really get to know a man is to hear his voice and to meet. You know, or you will, if, you, if you'd like to chat, I'd be happy to share my number. So you're not being aggressive. You're being assertive. Um, I think there's a huge difference. And to be in your feminine is to say, here's what I'd like. Here's what makes me happy. And give the man the ability to step up and say, yeah, I'd love your number. And here's mine too. So, you know, in case you want to recognize the number when I call you and what's a good time to talk. It's not online dating. It's on, you know, it's online meeting. It's like you're not, you're online connecting. You're not dating until you actually get on the date. And what do you tell women about the texting? You know, if you start to date someone and all of a sudden you find that, well, I'm, I'm interested in him. Maybe the coffee date went really well, but she's noticing that she, he's not really calling, but he's tending to text. What, what's your advice about that? Get off text. <laughs> Can I make it a little more clear? <laughs> Texting is for facts. It's for location. I'm going to be five minutes late. It's not to get to know somebody. And again, that's a standard. Let a man know. I don't text um, important conversations. I don't text when I don't know someone. There's too many misunderstandings. So the way we say these things really matters because we can shut a man down. Mm -hmm. We have to let him know, look, I loved me. You know, it was great meeting you and I, I can't wait to see you again or I'd love to talk to you on the phone. You know, you see that little phone icon on your phone, that little phone handle thing, you know, <laughs> press it, see if it works. <laughs> So yeah, use humor. I mean, have fun with it. But everybody's hiding behind text these days and yeah. ruining relationships, ruining. I mean, it's just even before they get started. Um, so yeah, no texting. Great. I love it. And are there any other important standards that you think a woman should think about when starting to date? Other things they, they should keep in mind? Sex, kissing touching, um, even just touching. You know, I, I was on a date with a man who called himself sapiosexual. It was a term I had to look up because, you know, when they first started seeing it, I'm like, what the hell is that? And um, for anyone who doesn't know, it's, it's a term that means that, men, you know, people who are attracted sexually to intelligence it's, um, in this case, he was just sexual. I mean, he was intelligent, but <laughs> he was really sexual. So we, we get on the date and, um, and he starts like massaging my hands from the minute we sat down. Mm. And then talking to me about maybe like, why don't we just like go to the bathroom here? I mean, we were having like coffee at a, you know, a little coffee shop. You know, we could just go do it in the bathroom. I'm like, ha ha ha, no, thank you. But we had fun. Here's where I said another standard. <laughs> I got a text from him. What are you doing right now? Okay, ladies, that's code word for booty call. Uh huh. In okay. case you don't know. <laughs> and I said, why? What? Why? What do you want to know? I mean, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, you know, I'm leaving in a couple hours. I was just wondering if you want to come over. Okay, that's pretty clear, booty call. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, that won't work for me. Um, but what does, you know, what would work better is to, uh, I said something like, I would like to see you again sometime um, for lunch or dinner. 
I was clear, not at your house. And um, in two seconds, he texted back, um, great, uh, lunch tomorrow, you pick the place near you and I'll come. So, you know, it seemed to be going really well. And, and then we're going out for sushi and he's, can I sit next to you in the booth? Okay. And then can I touch you here? Can I touch you there? Can I, and no, no. And I had just written an article in the Good Men Project about um, the number one thing that women need that men don't always respect, and that is safety. Mm. And I told him about it. I told him about the article, and I said, I don't feel safe with you. Yeah. I was very clear. I don't feel safe with you yet, and you cannot touch me there. And he was like, oh, that's yeah, a good okay. boundary. Yeah, I get it. Totally get it. Can I touch you here? <laughs> so at the end, he was done. He was done with me because it was not about the sapiosexual. It was about sex. And yeah. so, you know, you can set your boundaries and see how people respect or don't respect them. And the ones who don't respect them are making their needs more important than yours. And that's really good information for you to walk away. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. What do you tell women who are seeking a committed partnership or who want something more long term in terms of sex and dating? Do you tell them that they should wait a certain time period or what's your, what, what do you give them in terms of advice about that? I'm not a rules girl. I'm a principles girl. And I don't believe that three dates or 90 days, as Steve Harvey says, or whatever people say, it's too random. You know, most men won't stick around for 90 days. Um, most women want to sleep with a guy before 90 days. <laughs> So three dates, I mean, what if you had two bad dates? And, you know, so again, figure out your principles around sex and exclusivity and um, STD testing and, um, you know, and pay attention to your past history. So I had a client once who said, oh, I, I'm totally into casual dating right now. I'm not, I, I'd be fine with a casual date. And she was dating this guy and then she ended up sleeping with him and the next day she's absolutely frantic because he hadn't called her mm. and I said this is a casual dating you became attached you can't yeah. help it you have oxytocin that gets you know released and and you got attached to him and you started having expectations that now he's supposed to call you and now he doesn't respect you and now I'm devastated and now it's my self-esteem is in the toilet and you know, don't do this to yourself, ladies. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And we don't, we can avoid it. So when you're a woman of value, you value yourself first. And you say, okay, what do I need? Not to please him, but for myself. Um, I have so many women who are so concerned about him and not hurting his feelings. And start here, you know, mm -hmm. and don't be other focused at this point. It's, um, you know, the things that are really important to you have to be line in the sand things that you set your standards on. And so, you know, was, I have this client who is very interested in this guy and they've been on a number of dates and he was moving quickly. And um, so they had make out sessions a few times and then they were like lying on his bed. And of course that that's conducive. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and she just, said to him, listen, I really like you and I want to take it slow. And she still had her match profile open. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked actually today about it, whether she was going to shut down her profile and just date him. And I said, you know, it's okay to just date him. It's not saying I'm marrying you. It's saying mm -hmm. I like you enough to want to focus on you. That's fine. That doesn't also mean you're going to sleep with him yet, you know. So each thing is according to your pace and what feels good to you. And again, you have to have these open discussions like, you know, here's what works for me. 
what about you? Yeah, I love, love that. And the oxytocin, the bonding hormone you were talking about, I think has been known to create relationships that probably otherwise wouldn't have gone the distance if it weren't for that oxytocin and the great sex. So mm. slowing it down just a little bit, I, I like your advice, getting to know yeah. the person, the compatibility. Well, I feel like I, something I've said is that sex can make you stupid. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're not thinking straight anymore. You're, you're not seeing any of his flaws. You're like, oh my God, he's amazing. And I see women talk about this all the time in my Facebook group. You know, I met this amazing guy. He's so great, you know, but he's, he's an alcoholic and he, you know, he's, he's hit me and I'm like, what? He's not a great guy. Yeah. Get out. You know, it's just that, but the sex is great. So they, they keep ignoring these glaring, horrible things. So please don't do this, ladies. Take off the oxytocin glasses. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> great. That's great advice. Thank you. And you also talk about the velvet rope and laying down the velvet rope. What Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, it's actually a pink velvet rope. <laughs> so you can your rope, okay. <laughs> You can tell I like pink. I can. <laughs> I'm wearing kind of pink today. <laughs> the reason I, I say a pink velvet rope is velvet is soft and pink is a feminine color. And I believe that you need to figure out your standards and keep them roped off. Like you, when you go to a movie theater and there's the stanchion, it's called, and they'll open it for the right, you know, when you're ready to go in, when they're ready to let you in. <laughs> There's a little mm -hmm. hook there. And so you have your little hook ready to let the right people in, but they have to first meet your standards and they have to be balancing your head and your heart. You know, it has to be both. It can't be just one. So when you're not ready, the, the velvet road stays up. It's soft though. It's not this wall. I really like that metaphor, that mm. concept. There's, Thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an exclusive club and you have it to is. really... Yeah, to really have some standards to come in here. I, I like that. And the right men, uh, that's like, you know, the secret sauce. You know, mm -hmm. having a woman with standards who's soft and not harsh, that's the key. Mm -hmm. um, but that's like, she's drama free. She's not some crazy wacko who keeps everything inside and then explodes. And, and he doesn't know what to predict from minute to minute. But if you know yourself and you're calm about how to express yourself and you let him know, hey, I think you're hot and I'm not ready yet. Well, I love that. And in addition to the, the pink velvet rope, you actually have a five-step method to set clear boundaries. So can you explain what that is, the five-step method? I will. Um, so I can't go into great detail about each one. But it's kind of actually the similar method that I just took people through in my broken picker challenge. Um, I had a five-day challenge to improve your broken picker. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, so much of our broken picker comes from not setting standards and not mm. even knowing what they are. So step number one is to know yourself and know what your core needs are. Um, and I'm going to share an exercise in a little bit with you about how to mine for those core needs and core values that we oh, have. Oh, great. Yeah. So um, most people, I mean, when I started doing my coaching courses, that was one of the first things we started with too, is our values. And I didn't ever really define them, which is why I ended up in the wrong partnership. Mm. Um, so I think this is number one. So know who you are, know what your needs are. Um, and when I work with clients, by the way, I give them an operating manual to fill out. Um, I created this operating manual that is for them. And it's for them to identify what are your core needs in your physical needs that, that includes sleeping and eating and, you know, what, are, what foods are important to you. You need to be able to own that and communicate that to others. So you don't want to give up those needs for other people. This is really important. So that's your sexual needs. Your, your, you know, are you an introvert or extrovert? Like all those things are going to be valuable, valuable information for the people around you. 
So that's step number one. Number two is know your must-haves and deal breakers in a relationship. So you need to be able to know really at the bottom is how you want to feel when you're in a relationship. Most people have must-have lists that are ridiculous. <laughs> I yeah. keep that word. But it's, it's, um, it's not going to bring your beloved to you. It's okay. going to keep him from you because you're probably missing the most amazing guys because your list includes things that are nice to have, but they're not must-haves. So like we said before, somebody who can weather a crisis, you know, mm -hmm. not just a fine, fine fair weather friend, um, that's really critical. I've broken up with people because they weren't my friend, you know, yeah. they didn't show up. And um, so that's step number two. Number three is express yourself clearly and compassionately in a way that men can understand. Mm. So I want to say that again, because there's a lot of components to this. So you want to express yourself clearly and compassionately. So both of those are important in a way that men can understand, because men are not women. They're not hairy women like Alison <laughs> are. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, um, and we need to be able to understand them and how they think and how they receive what we're saying so that we can say it in a way that gets through to them. So you want to make sure that you're talking to men at a time when they're not in the middle of another task. And mm -hmm. you want to bottom line your answers and questions and, and um, requests because he's not going to be able to track you when you're all over the place. Um, things like that will be game changers. So once you know yourself, your core needs, your must-haves and deal breakers, then you can express yourself in a much more clear way. This is what I need. Um, how do you feel about that? And you have a dialogue and a grown-up conversation. Number four is let go of the small stuff because most stuff is small stuff and really focus only on the big stuff because otherwise you're going to be freaking out over every little thing and that is a, um, it's just, it, it pushes relationships away. And number five is know how to walk away with grace to make space for the right man. I see too many women and men hanging on to the wrong relationships because of fear of there may not be someone else. And if you do not make that space, you will not find him. And I have a client, I'm so celebrating this today. She, she was holding on to a guy for four years and uh -huh. he was really unkind. She could not walk away. She kept walking away, coming back, walking away, coming back. And the, he was like her kryptonite. I kept telling him, oh. your kryptonite. And um, she had to get to a point where she valued herself enough. She did all this initial work with me. And she needed to set like a, a line in the sand. I'm done. You are not being kind. I'm looking for a man who's kind and compassionate. So she knew what she wanted. And he came back with like 20 texts and emails and phone calls and you're good grief. You're being ridiculous. Oh my God. I can't believe, which is you know, now she can see, she was like, Oh wow. He's not kind. And so she to finally do it. Wow. <laughs> wow. I, I like that. that. The kryptonite. <laughs> that's, that's sometimes <clears throat> how it feels to let that person go because that that's like the fear of the unknown. Well, mm -hmm. if I let him go, then I'll have no one. But the idea of, but yeah, but you're not with the right one. So making the space so you have the space to bring in the right one. But I know that can be a struggle for, for a lot of women. Well, we want to be able to control the situation. We want to know all the answers. We want to read the last page of the book before we've read the beginning and we don't even know the story. And so that fear of the unknown, um, I, I interviewed Amy Baglin, who's the, the CEO and founder of meetmindful.com, which is mm. a, a dating site for mm -hmm. those who are looking for more thoughtful relationships um, and meaningful relationships. And she brought up a beautiful metaphor that she learned in a, um, in a, a big seminar that she was at. And they were talking about that fear of going into the unknown and they compared it to a trapeze artist who has to let go of one ring uh, to get to the next ring. Yeah. And there's that small space where you're suspended in midair and it could be so frightening. 
but you're moving towards your big yes. And I, I, that's the way I see it. It's that big yes. That is that beautiful big thing that you're moving towards because so many times in life, we don't know. I didn't know what was on the other side of my divorce. I didn't leave my husband for another man. And I was starting a new career. I was still in school. I mean, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. How was I going to pay my bills? But I believed in my decision and my big yes was out there. And, you know, moving towards this new career was a huge, beautiful net for me to fall into. Even if the money wasn't there yet, the joy was there. And, you know, when we can really focus on gratitude and what we have um, and really become more mindful and more centered in our lives, it doesn't really get scary anymore. You know, I, I have to say that even when I gave birth to my son, who was not well, I wasn't really frightened. And I also wasn't really angry because I didn't expect everything in my life to always be perfect. And that is an expectation. Every baby that's born will be perfect and healthy. And, mm. and so I said, okay, here's what is. I mean, this is what is. This is what we need to focus on now. It's not what we expected, but it's, it's still beautiful. Mm. And, you know, and that kind of appreciation is something that's so important in life and in love. It's really, it sounds to me like it's, uh, it's faith. It's, it's that sense of, I think another reason why people have a difficult time leaving the wrong relationship is because they, they aren't inside of that. You said you're reaching towards that. Yes, because they don't think it's possible. And so what you're talking about really sounds to me like really it's more about, it's more important about that. Yes. About that vision and the, knowing that it is possible to have and being more aligned with that than with, this wrong partnership, knowing that this is what I'm really committed to having. And your, your five-step, your process that you just laid out is really supportive of that too, getting to the core needs and the things that are really important to you so that you know, okay, this is what I'm needing and it's so possible. And so I'm ready to release from this trapeze to go towards the yes. That's, so I love how your process gets, gets women to that. Mm, thank you. And, and I want to also just say one thing, because sometimes that big yes sounds too big. Um, so I want to just say that it's not just about the destination. It's about the journey. And so, true. And so you know, what I was speaking about before this, this abyss that was in front of me after my divorce, it was ev every choice that I made was made from a place of love for myself, for my life, for my children. Um, knowing what was possible, knowing that I had suppressed so much of who I was. So anything had to be better than that. Mm -hmm. And every time you become more aligned with your purpose, with your passions, it doesn't really matter if the date doesn't work out. If you're on a date, you're, you're meeting a human being. That person is touching your life. I mean, I had a conversation this week with a new man who, he was really strange, but he was interesting. And <laughs> I, I learned some new things and, you know, he was like brilliant, but not a romantic match for me. And I think, you know, that, that sense of appreciation that you're meeting other people and they're each a step in your journey. Um, Cause if all you think about is your destination in anything, I mean, if you're, if you're a marathon runner and you finish the marathon and you're like, what's next, what's next, what's next, or you, you're, you're trying to win a race or whatever it is, <clears throat> you might win it. And then you're going to be really disappointed right after. Because yeah, because now what? Yeah, yeah, what's next? So you've really got to focus on the appreciation of each person who comes into your life. They're all your teachers. So important. You can learn about yourself and about the men you're dating. And I take my clients through this process of debriefing dates by learning you know, about themselves and about the men they date so that there's always a focus on what did I like about him? What am I learning? How am I growing? What, what, am I, what am I proud of that I did on this date? You know, mm -hmm. oh, I spoke up. I stated my standards, you know. I said, I'm, I, you're really a nice guy, but I don't think we're a romantic match. And I said it on the first date. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's all of that, you know, celebrating what is not, oh, my God, another date. Oh, I'm so burnt out. <laughs> yeah. 
And I, and I really appreciate too that what you just said about uh, coming from a place of love and this place of love for yourself. And, and also it, it's the deep appreciation for the other person, even if it's not the right person. But you just said yourself, I've met someone and very interesting. And then I'm sure you had a great conversation, just the person's humanity, getting to know another human being, but not the right person. And that to me sounds like such a loving place to be coming from. Mm. So much better than dread. <laughs> mm -hmm. So how do you support women to get to, I think you said you had an exercise about how to get to the core needs. Can you share yes, that with us? I have many exercises and um, one that I love because I found that sometimes some of the more esoteric ones are hard for women to really grasp. Um, I have a lot of beautiful guided meditations, but this one is really about thinking about your, one of your earliest memories of being happy and joyous. Mm. So if you can play along with me and tell me. Oh, sure. Should I close yeah. my eyes? Um, you can if you want. It's just really think, think about where you were, who you were with, uh, what was happening to you. Um, just a moment of, of joy. And, and when you're ready, tell me about it. Okay, I thought of something from when I was very small and I was with my dad and we were in a tree and we were just talking. I think it was an orange tree because we had a lot of fruit trees in the backyard where I used to live when I was little. Mm. And so we would climb into the tree. Um, we might even have been eating an orange too, but just talking. And then I was just asking little girl questions, you know, like, why is the sky blue? And, you know, and he was telling me answers. And so I think what comes to me in that memory, the word that comes to me in that memory is connection. One of the core values that you were living in that moment was connection. I think so. Yeah. And, and I know that's really important to me now. And just watching you, you know, tell the memory, you know, you can see the love and compassion in your face for your father in that moment. Like, I, I really sensed it. There was this sense of, I'm going to say, like, peace. Yeah. And love and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, how, how can you connect that to today and how compassion or connection is important to you today? Oh, it's super important to me. Um, I know that, that in love relationship and in, in every relationship that I really value a depthful connection and being able to go deep with people, you know, and, and sometimes it doesn't mean necessarily that I need to sit around having these philosophical or depthful hours long conversations, but feeling that I can really it starts with me, you know, it's extending the invitation to another person uh, by going within and connecting with myself first. If I'm not connected to myself, then I'm not really going to be connected to someone else. I, mm -hmm. I learned that on my journey. Um, so deeply connecting with myself and then from there being able to connect with another person and sharing authentically you know, who I am or sharing what I'm feeling, um, even in moments when maybe I don't want to do that and I want to stay safe, um, being able to really just be who I am and be seen and heard and witnessed by the other person and to be with people who can receive that and who are interested in who it is I am and what I have to say and, and vice versa. And, and I know, you know, in my past in some relationships I didn't always have that um, but at that time I wasn't necessarily listening to my own inner self my own deepest needs I was really good at pushing them down so over time that's now become something that's a core need and it's interesting that it was there when I was that small child yeah. and then over time we grow and things happen in life and mm. you start to sort of haze over um, but I've come back to that, mm. you know, over time. So, 
Beautiful. So, you know, I love so many things about what you said and that we do often forget that it's there. And I think people think they have to find something that was never there. And mm. our values, I believe we are really born with these values. I, I, I look at small children, you can see the you can see their personalities from a really young age and how giving and kind and connecting they are or not. Um, but the other thing that came to mind when you were talking about connection is, um, well, also what happened when it wasn't there. You know, so the, that's a good way to know your values is to think about when you don't honor them, what part of you has withered, you know, mm -hmm. to think about that. Um, and the other part I was thinking about was being present because in that moment in the tree with your father, you're really present. Mm -hmm. And so when you're not concerned with what's he thinking about me and uh, do I look good and, you know, do I have a zit? And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is he going to call? Right. And so <laughs> you're, you're connected. You're, you're being really present with another person. So I encourage everybody who's listening to do this exercise and, and do it as many times as you can. Think about a time when you were joyous. Think about a time when you were sad and things were in, and your values were not being met. Think about times when you felt really disconnected from yourself and what was missing. So you can do it either in the joyous moments or in the missing moments. Um, and you can also do it in peak moments, like something pivotal that happened in your life and what mm -hmm. values were being honored at that time. So this is an important exercise, and I encourage you to find at least four or five values that are absolutely critical for you to live by and not to give up for anybody ever. Love that. Thank you. What a great tool. Well, I'm wondering, do you have time to share with us any kinds of scripts around boundaries when women get themselves into situations and they're not quite sure what to do or what to say? Do you have any advice about that? Yeah, I think it's really important to have these at your ready because what happens is we often get flooded. We're in, we're in a sticky situation and we, we freeze um, or we scream and yell. <laughs> you know, so we usually have one, or those, one of those two responses. And if you want to stay calm, you want to be prepared. Uh, so I actually teach a course on boundaries with a co-leader, Teresa Byrne, who came mm. up with the concept of boundaries in your back pocket. And I love I love the concept, and um, we're we're actually about to start shooting some videos to um, to launch our our course again in March of this year. And this year we're going to be doing it both for couples and for singles because before it was only for singles. Um, so Teresa is actually a martial arts expert. She had a martial arts studio for many years, and she taught both per personal boundaries, emotional boundaries, and also. Uh, physical boundaries. So yeah. we, have, we have a nice synergy. Um, anyway, so um, if somebody asks you for a favor, um, wants, wants you to do something for them, most people will have this like gut response. Um, sure, I'll do it. And then you go home and go, what did I say that for? Yeah. I don't what did I just that. commit myself to? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I like the 24 hour rule for myself. And I, can I get back to you about that tomorrow? You know, oh, that's a good that. one. Get back to you about that. So whatever it is for you, if it's in an hour, it could be like you're in the middle of a fight with somebody and um, you can set a boundary also about setting some time and space between the conversation that you're having now and the conversation you want to have when you're calm. And so a boundary could be, I'm too upset right now to respond. I, mm -hmm. I need to take some time to cool off so I don't say something I might regret. Can I speak to you in an hour? Can I speak to you tomorrow? Can I, you know, but it's done with respect. It's not done by stonewalling and walking out of the room. You know, I need to take some time so I can calm down and have a respectful conversation with you. Um, so that's, that's another boundary to set. Um, if somebody, you know, wants to touch you and you're not comfortable, just say, I'm not comfortable with that, you know, and then state your standard or sorry, that won't work for me. I've said, like I said to the guy with the opera, sorry, that won't work for me. What I would like to do is, yeah. So that's an important end of that discussion is what would work better is. And I highly recommend that we, we set boundaries by saying what doesn't work and following it with what does work. And one of my favorite boundaries is one word and it's ouch. Ouch. 
ouch. So somebody hurts your feelings, says something nasty, ouch. That's all you need to say. Your aunt says, why are you still single? <laughs> ouch. <laughs> um, it's a good one to have in your back pocket. And it was taught to me by one of my first coaches. Um, you know, it was like I had trouble setting boundaries. That's why I teach boundaries. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a great one. It's easy. And it's, it's, uh, it's always in your back pocket. <laughs> wow, those are great. You know, when I'm, I was listening to you share your scripts with these boundaries, and it, I was just thinking that for some of us, it can be so hard, you know, that initial time you're like, oh, God, I don't know if I can say this. You're talking about it, about this idea that societally, sometimes it feels like we're bitchy if we have these boundaries. But the way that you just spoke them, they sound so doable. And so you're talking about being a woman of worth and value. And it's not about this, you know, being aggressive, but just about, uh, no, I, I, that really won't work for me, but can I, can I get back to you in 24 hours? It's like, yeah, that's, why can't I do that? I know I talk to women a lot who, who say this. And so I love the, the, um, words that you just use. They seem very doable. Thank you. Boundaries are not bitchy. Boundaries are beautiful. They're really beautiful. And it's, protects you, it keeps you safe and sane, and it helps others because they know where you end and they begin. And we but, lose sight yeah. of that line a lot. It feels like it, that you're also creating the sense of safety for someone that you're dating. Yeah. So that they get the sense of like, wow, she really knows who she is and what she needs and where she stands and what she expects. And I can imagine that being on the other end of that, the person that you're with, pursuing a relationship with, is going to feel really safe as well. Absolutely. And, and I was always drawn to people like that. You know, growing up in my home with so much chaos, I found myself gravitating to homes that were clear, that had calm conversation, where parents were completely attentive to their children and celebrated them. And, and it was this healthy response that I had that I sought that out and I, I, I remember we had a therapist for one of our kids it was like a play therapy and this woman was so boundaried and so loving like the whole office was soft and beautiful and you had to take your shoes off but you can't walk in to, with your kid and you know and here's my payment schedule and this is how my business runs and you know very clear and mm -hmm. I loved it. I loved it. Um, I became friends with her. I just, I thought she was so amazing. So it's, it's lovely to be with people who, who say what they mean and mean what they say. And, you know, and then it's, it's just a beautiful relationship. So mm. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I think that this has been an incredibly eye-opening conversation. I know that you have just given so much value to the women in this community. So I really want to thank you for being with us today. Do you have any final thoughts? Set boundaries. <laughs> Speak <laughs> up. Speak up. Show up. You know, really don't be afraid to be you, but really find out who you are first. I think what so many coaches and, and love advice says is just soften, be yourself, be vulnerable, be open. And most people don't tell you how to get that inner strength. And inner strength comes before being open and vulnerable. Otherwise, you're, you're a mush ball, you know. Yes. And that's what my TED Talk is about. It's, it's about being a Tootsie Pop. And the Tootsie Pop <laughs> is soft on the inside and hard on the outside. Then you want to be the opposite. So, you know, it's, it's just so important to get those inner strength, you know, built up. Get that inner strength built up so that you can be that, that beautiful, soft, warm, loving, nurturing person who's also feisty and, you know, wonderful and smart and everything else. But that's, that's the secret sauce. That's what gets the healthy relationship that you're seeking. Thank you, Sandy. I know there is so much more for Sandy to share. And if you would like to learn more about Sandy, please make sure that you check out her free gift, 
It is five ways to set healthy boundaries in dating. It's a free guide to help set clear, healthy boundaries in dating and relationships so that you can stay safe and sane. And you can access that here on the page. The link is just below. Thank you for being here with us. And thanks again, Sandy. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half-hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application.